right. So today I am speaking to Kasha Rashfall, who was a former uh, insurance underwriter who reinvented her career to be an intuitive healer and business mentor. So after she left corporate in 2010, two years later, uh, she began homeschooling her two kids and have since built her business around all that comes with the homeschooling lifestyle. Uh, I'm really excited to speak to Kasha today because firstly, the Screw the Cubicle community is always loving uh, hearing about unconventional ways to sort of like bring your family uh, with your location independent dreams. Uh, but I also really want to speak to Kasha about the work she does, which is so important, uh, helping people release old stories and emotions to really allow them to bring uh, joy, clarity, and courage into their life, which is what we always need when we're making a transition. Uh, so thank you so very much for joining me today, Kasha. Thanks, Lydia. I'm really so excited to be here. It's such an honor. Yeah, and I, I'm going to love this conversation because there's sort of two parts to this conversation. Uh, the, the reason why I approached you to begin with was sort of I needed more people to talk about the family part, which is obviously something I can't speak about. I don't have a family at the moment, but you do. Um, but before we get into sort of how you... Um, create that environment to allow your family and, and allow the dreams for your business to be in alignment with the dreams of your family as well. I sort of want to start the conversation with your story. Uh, so what was your turning point like, like when you decided to leave this career that you've worked so hard for and climbed the corporate ladder for? Um, how did you then find your new career path? What instigated that change for you? Well, you know, Lydia, it was not a one awakening moment thing. It was more of a gradual awareness that my soul was being sucked out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wasn't, even though it, like insurance is absolutely a necessary thing. Um, it helps put people back, you know, from loss. It, it's great. But it just it wasn't like, it mm -hmm. really wasn't. Um, I was helping people, but I, something was missing. And I grew up... Um, you know, you go to school, you get a job, and you stay in the job, and then you retire. That was sort of how I was brought up. And so that's what I did. I finished high school, went to university, got a degree. That job seemed to fit, like it sounded intriguing. So there I was working in a cubicle. <laughs> Didn't even have a window. Um, right. And somewhere, you know, five, six years later, I just sort of realized, like, there has to be more to life than this. This is great, and the steady paycheck is great but this isn't fulfilling me. And at the same time, you know, I'd had my children, I was really struggling with postpartum. Um, back when postpartum, they were sort of thinking like, it's baby blues. No, this was like, crap. This was, mm. this sucked. Um, we had all kinds of other stuff going on. And I was profoundly unhappy in my life. And I didn't, like, I couldn't understand it because I had a great job. I had two healthy kids, an amazing husband. Like I live in, in the most amazing you know, place in Canada, in British Columbia. Why was I so unhappy? And I went to a counselor. They gave me um, antidepressants, which helped for about three weeks. And I went back to being unhappy. And I thought, okay, this, this is not working for me. So something has to change. And because I had people in my life, especially um, my parents-in-law, who are two of the most happy people like you will ever meet, I thought, okay, like, what do they know that I don't? <laughs> yeah. And so that sort of sparked the flame. And, um, and I just like, I knew there had to be an answer. And so I was stubborn enough, thankfully, to want to seek that out. And one day a girlfriend at the time said, you know, you should be a life coach. And I had never heard that term before. And when she said those words, it's like a light bulb went on in my head. And I thought, oh my God, yeah, of course, of course I'm going to be a life coach. And so I found a school, got certified in the school, a whole bunch of synchronicity, synchronicities happened. Um, now I'm on the West Coast. The school was New York time. So I'm getting up at 3 a.m. to go to class, then going to work. The, you know, That's a commitment. Yeah, I was like, I'm doing this. And met some people who introduced me to um, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Matthew James, who's a neuro-linguistic programming teacher. And again, intrigued me enough that I signed up for those trainings, went through all those trainings, and then through that found energy work and actually HUNA, which is a Hawaiian-based spirituality. And, and then I ended up going back to school and getting a transpersonal psychology degree. So it was like this wow. synchronistic way of... of Yes, wanting to help people because, you know, all the stuff I've studied, especially the science behind it, because I'm like equally spiritual and scientific geek at the same time. It made sense to me. It changed my life so profoundly that I was going to go out there and change the world. But first mm. and foremost, it was always a selfish reason because I continued to make progress in my unhappiness, but it, nothing made it go away entirely. 
Yeah, I love that you shared the story because I think a lot of meaningful businesses come from your own pain. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a solving of your own problem, uh, and 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 then you resonate with it on a deep level, right? Yeah. And when you are doing, uh, you know, when you're in the business of helping, which is things like therapy, coaching, uh, mm-hmm. you know, mentorship for other humans, is is more than just learning the technical pieces, right, of how to coach someone, but actually really having a full understanding of what it feels like to be in this person's shoes. Right. Yes. So you yes. going through it first and having to go through that stickiness of pain and, and understanding that, Hey, you can still be like messy and, mm-hmm. and not perfect and still make it out of there breathing, you know, uh, it yes. sort of allows you to, to empathize, I think really, yes. really well. Um, and I'm also loving the fact that you talked about, you know, um, making that first step, like, Oh my God, that light bulb moment hit. And I want to follow that feeling, you know, mm-hmm. and not know where it could lead to. Like you could have absolutely just became a general, very general sort of life coach without, you know, thinking about NLP or wherever else that, that you later on accumulated those skills. But because of starting, I think you ended up getting more opportunities or opening up more doors. Um, and did you feel that way? Like you had to just make a decision first and then yes. sort of the next door sort of open without you even controlling it? Totally. And, and that was sort of, I was really new to spirituality at that point. So everything, I, I felt like a two-year-old sort of eating the world and, and not understanding the synchronicities. It just seemed, it, it, it satisfied my logical brain, not so much the other side of me. But now looking back, I was like, of course, of course I was led. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So this, this new, you know, being a new entrepreneur and obviously in a completely new industry as well mm-hmm. for you must be quite a transition. Uh, and so with, at the time you have, you, you have, how many kids do you have? I have two. You have two kids. Okay. So being a mom of two and obviously going through the change of transition from employee to entrepreneur, like this life path isn't easy, right? To do it with your family in tow <laughs> as well, right? Um, and so how has choosing this new life and work path changed the way you raise your children? And how do you balance family and being an, a busy entrepreneur? Oh my God, such a big question. <laughs> you know, growing up, believing that you have to get a job and not really knowing anybody who had a business because I'm actually from Poland. And when Mm. I lived in Poland, it was still communist. So business was not allowed, like enterprise was forbidden. And so then moving to Canada and and just sort of, you know, being open to different ways of being, um, business was this intriguing thing. And I actually went to school to get a business degree. um, But again, never actually considered my own business until I profoundly was able to heal some stuff inside myself and and realize like I am never going to have the impact I want to have while I'm an underwriter. It's just the, you know, the standards in that industry, you're basically saying yes, no to insurance applications. I want to like help people. And so um, diving into business and and hiring coaches and and learning how to network and really um, opening myself up to that world, I realized I had to get to know myself on such a profound level. Like business, just like parenting, pushes your buttons so much. It's like, it's almost the same, <laughs> just in, in different ways. Well, I've and always so- said that the first year of business is like, um, like 10 years of therapy. You know, you oh really have to get to know who you are and your capability. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And so I realized what, you know, that, that this is such a cool life. As, as hard as it is, to figure out all the stuff, all the marketing, all the systems. And like now it seems easy because we've got um, technology has come so far. But I thought, you know, it was important for my parents that I go to school, that I go to university, get a degree, blah, blah, blah. It's not important to me that my kids do that. Because what's most important to me is that my kids know who they are that they are curious about the world, that they know what they're passionate about, that they know what they're good at, that they know how to find information, how to connect with people, how to build a network, um, and, and learn, not by having someone else like shovel knowledge into or information into their head, but really know how to be wise. And, and, you know, so, so, you know, homeschooling is sort of a general term. Under homeschooling, there's so many different ways of doing it. And truthfully, we've, like, we, this is our year five of homeschooling because my kids did actually go to school up until grade two and grade four. Um, we unschooled for the first several years of our journey Ooh. just to get the system out of my system, not even the kids, because they were like, woohoo, <laughs> we don't have to do anything. But I really had to ask myself, like, what's important? Is it important that my son learns fractions in October in grade five, because that's what the other grade fives are doing? Or is it more important that we spend the time 
you know, nurturing who he is or um, spent time, you know, connecting and that sort of thing. So, so it was, it was like a paradigm shift for me, complete and total paradigm shift um, as far as what's important in life to know and, you know, information versus wisdom. Um, I don't know if that. Yeah, I love that. Well, I mean, I never really even know, knew about world schooling or homeschooling. Like, world <laughs> schooling is like a completely different concept as well uh, until I moved over to Bali and met <laughs> uh, amazing women entrepreneurs that were balancing, like, you know, four kids in the family and yeah. being a full time entrepreneur. I mean, this was sort of unheard of for me when I was in Vancouver. Most of my mom friends are like full time moms, you know, or they really need a lot of assistance or they have daycare, whatever it is that they need to even be able to go to work, you know? And so for the longest time, I was sort of, I had to choose between having children or having a business. And it's sort of like, I don't want to choose, you know? So there must be an alternative than this sort of traditional way of raising kids. And, and, and that's what I, I'm so interested to sort of talk about. So homeschooling, mm -hmm. you know, this is a big topic for families. I've been asked to interview people who homeschool their kids. And that's why you're here. Um, mm -hmm. Because people want to be able to, you know, especially when they build their online businesses, it's like, okay, well, how does that now allow me to have different opportunities now, right? Now that I'm not stuck in one location, what are the other alternatives for education as well? Mm -hmm. um, so people want to travel with their business. Um, and their life and be able to still educate their kids along the way. And I love that you talked about spending time with your children, which is in itself education for them, you know, feeling, knowing who they are and knowing who they are in the world without it being dictated by a curriculum. Uh, right. it, it is, is cool, you know, especially in the beginning parts of, of their ages. Um, but can you tell us more about sort of like how you, what, what was the sort of angle of homeschooling? Because you said there's some sort of different ways to do it. Like, what, how did you pick the style or the approach that you like to homeschool your kids? And what are some of the pros and cons of, of homeschooling your kids? Sure. So um, when my kids were in school and I was in business, um, I connected with some other mom entrepreneurs who, had, who were homeschooling their kids. And so this was sort of my first foray. And one of them was very much 100% unschooled. And the other one was sort of dabbling in curriculum, but her kids, um, one of the kids was really driven. The other one was sort of all over the place. And I loved the flexibility of that. Um, being the geek that I am, I got a bunch of books and read a bunch of blogs. And the sort of overarching piece of advice that stuck um, out of all of that is take the first year and get the system out of your system. So like, unschool or de-school or whatever you want to call it because you want to get to know your kid and you know like my kids were very um they weren't in school that long so they didn't really get like whittled into that round peg that they want to put in, into the round holes in the system um so there wasn't a lot of unschooling for my kids but for me because i had gone through like university and then graduate school and and the I had to the system, my system. So the unschooling um, kind of happened because of that piece of advice. I had grandiose ideas that we're going to have all this amazing full time at home and we're going to do worksheets and read books and like do documentaries. And no, my kids were not into that. <laughs> um, so it kind of flew out the window and I, I was able to just breathe and let the kids be kids. Um, one of our philosophies with my husband and I is that you spend so much time being an adult. Why not like be a kid? You know, where, where I grew up, um, I was mostly unschooled in Poland. I didn't go to school until I was much older. Well, much like seven, I think. And, you know, and I immigrated to Canada and they put me ahead of grade because I don't know why I guess I just fit better in that other in that other grade so so asking myself all these questions like what's important to know and, and do my kids really need to do tests you know and so there's all these camps that are always on. the biggest pros I think are you you get to know your kids on on a whole other level your kids get to know themselves they, they know what they're passionate about and they have the time to explore their passions fully because you don't just have 45 minutes to dive into whatever it is and then you have to change subjects because then it's the next period. Um, what else? I find, oh, the biggest argument, and this is gonna like open a big, big can of worms because um, socialization. Right. Are my kids socialized? God, I hate that question. So to me, socialization means you know how to connect with another human being. 
Mm -hmm. which means you know how to look them in the eye when you're talking to them. You can talk to them on a variety of topics. Um, you can, you're approachable. You know how to speak to people of all ages. If you meet a homeschooler, that's who those kids are for the most part. You know, there's, there's always situations where, where there's a special needs or something, but for the most part, all homeschoolers are amazing kids who will talk to you like a human not like a kid talks to an adult or, or like a kid talks to an authority figure. Um, and I found socializing in a homeschooling environment so much more natural than like a bunch of 12 year olds in a room together, having to make friends and figure out a pecking order because that's what society tells them to do. Like you're, yeah. you're in this classroom, figure it out. Now you're socialized. I think that's crap. So anyway, that's like, <laughs> there's my rant. Yeah, I agree. I want some cons. So cons, I guess, um, one of the biggest ones I think for, that I've bumped up against would be um, putting enough things in front of your kids. You know, like the funding as a homeschooling family isn't there to, to put your kids in all the activities that they might want to do or, or put them in all the things. So you do get a little bit of funding. We work with a school called Self Design, which is very liberal, very flexible. We have an amazing teacher that we work with that um, they're called learning consultants. So we report to her every week. She gives us resources and stuff, but um, it's just like, there's not enough time to eat the world the way we want to. Um, and you know, we don't have a science lab at home. So some of those things you kind of got to just either not do them or do the best you can. So yeah. I would say that would be probably the biggest one is, you know, or, or putting your kids in like a band or, um, you know, that's sort of, you do that all in your own time, I think is, is probably the biggest, but other than that, like, I can't think of, I can't think of a con that, that would make me want to stop doing this. I just, I can't. <laughs> yeah. I think once you, you, you are able to work from home and, and see the benefits of being, you know, the whole point sometimes of people starting businesses is to have more time for their children, yeah. you know, and this is sort of a, a good, um, um, start point, but then the education piece, of course, is the next question. And I think a lot of people have this sort of last question I'm going to ask you about homeschooling, which is, do you ever fear um, having to integrate your kids back into society because they've been homeschooled? Like if they wanted, if they chose to go back, so at, at 12 years old or 15 years old, they're like, actually, mom, I really want to just go to a traditional school. Is there an opportunity to still do that with a homeschool curriculum? Is that like on a legal, no, I, maybe I'm saying it wrong, but um, standardized wise, you know, can they continue to go down that path if they choose to in, in a more traditional sense. Absolutely. And actually um, here in Kelowna, we have quite a big community of homeschoolers and the kids periodically will decide, you know, I'm going to try school again this year and they go and they fit right in mostly um, except that they get bored and then they want to leave again or they find that they're actually ahead or they're not behind at all, even though they might not have done math every single day for the last however long. So it's, it's so interesting that you learn all this stuff that you learn in school, but you learn it through living life. Um, from my research and things I've read and some blogs I follow, even universities are not out of reach because homeschoolers tend to be a lot more well-rounded and really passionate about learning and passionate about um, like taking up causes in the world that they want to pursue. And so universities do um, have open spots available for kids who don't, you know, complete all the, um, I mean, it is important for, for my kids to get their dogwoods. So in, in BC, that means like your high school diploma. Um, I just think it's something good to have in your back pocket. So whatever exams are in place at the, because I think they got rid of a bunch of provincial exams, mm. actually, which is like, I wish they'd done that for me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, whatever, you know, the kids will need to do, will get done so they can get their diploma. Um, and they have the same opportunities available to them. Um, neither of my kids necessarily has the, the desire to be like a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, because they haven't that like that hasn't shown up, but there are some kids in our community who know they want to be like, we have this one brilliant little kid who wants to be like an astrophysicist and she knows that and she's doing the work at like 11 years old. So, so there are no limits. And because technology is what it is today, you can connect not only with other homeschoolers and other kids all over the world, but you can access courses and classes yeah. and learn anything, like anything. If the desire is inside you, you can learn it. 
Yeah, I love that. And I mean, I think I have witnessed that happen for families in Bali, for example, you know, Western families that come live here uh, mm -hmm. and they find, and the same thing, they, you, what you said is that they're much more open and well-rounded and this sort of self-assurance they have, you know, about who they are without it being tainted by what they've been told of who they are. You know, and I think a lot of us adults in a way wish that we could go back in time sometimes and unlearn some of the identity that's been put upon us because we weren't given that space, right, to sort of yeah. explore who we are in the time when our brains were very malleable and, you know, we were, we were, we were still children. Um, yeah. So I want to sort of go, go into the work you do because the work you do is also, uh, you know, with adults, right, that are wanting to release those old stories and old identities, right, um, you know, from, from preventing them from moving forward with a business or even the, the courage to take the leap, right, from a life that they no longer want. Uh, so you work with women entrepreneurs, right, by releasing uh, what you call the energetic and emotional imprint of their trauma and drama uh, mm -hmm. that wrote those stories uh, so they can get the clarity that they need and the direction for their business. So what are some of the emotional and toxic stories you've had to release yourself to go forth into this unknown path of entrepreneurship years ago? Mm -hmm. The two big ones that were the most pervasive was, um, and it's not pretty, one of them was regretting being a mom, and the other one was hating physical life, like hating being alive. So there's your two whoppers. Um, because of my stubbornness and because of my like tenacity to figure this shit out and not give up, because like I wasn't willing to do that. I wasn't willing to to commit suicide, even though I, I had those sort of moments. Um, it wasn't an option. And so, um, but I was mad, like I was mad at universe or God or whatever you call it, that, that I was here because whose sick joke is this? Like, well, I did not sign up for this. I, I didn't want this. Um, but there, here I was. And this is where the, the spiritual side of, of my journey really helped me up. Um, because you know, at some point I realized like spiritual and physical is like two sides of the same coin and, and one isn't better than the other. Like the, the spiritual grass isn't greener than the physical grass. Um, and so I was able to, to heal that. And then the motherhood thing, you know, I, I thought I was the only woman in the world and this is, I, I carried this shame so profoundly. And I even had a counselor ask me once, like, like, why did you choose to have kids then? And I was like, what, what, kind of a dumbass question is that I didn't know that I was going to feel like this before I had kids. <laughs> yeah. So, so it really like it made me dig deep and, and the journey led me ultimately to the Akashic records, which is what I work with exclusively now because it's been like so profoundly healing. And I've come to believe that our soul incarnates, you know, many people believe this, that our soul incarnates and some of the lessons that we play out in our life are not just uh, life. They actually drag on, carry on. And unless you know what the bigger purpose of that is, and you can sort of get a bird's eye view of, of the struggle you're going through um, and heal it at the soul level, it's going to keep perpetuating itself and coming up in your life. And that's what I found. Hmm. Um, again, not everyone believes this, but, but it's, it's, that's how I believe in, and you know, there are other people that I've helped who, who have had profound epic shifts because we've been able to do the work at the soul level. Um, so now coming back to business, like whatever business you're in, you got to know what to do. You got to do it. And then you got to deal with the crap that comes up as you're doing your work. And like we said before, business will push your buttons, right? Because mm. you got to be visible. You got to connect with people. You got to do marketing sales and all this stuff. And, and if you're a solopreneur, like many of us are, even if you have a small team, like a VA or whatever, you're still the face of your company. And so you got to face your stuff. And if you have, you know, trauma, drama, and, and trauma is in the eye of the beholder. My trauma is not your trauma. It's like, you know, there's no one box that, that it fits. Um, Sometimes that trauma doesn't happen in this lifetime explicitly, but things about your business, about your life trigger you so much that you find yourself paralyzed and, and you don't know why, like you've done the work, you've read the books, you've taken the courses, you've done the journaling, you've done the Reiki, you've meditated, you've vented all this stuff and you still keep banging it up against this wall. 
there's mm. probably soul level stuff going on. Um, so that's where, you know, that's where I, I come in and that's where I excel is, is helping you figure out what is it that, that you're stuck in, that you keep on that hamster wheel and then how mm. the hell to get off. And it's yeah. not about telling you what to do. It's not about, um, you know, giving you solutions. It's, it's like unlocking your truth. What is it that you're meant to learn? Mm. Giving you the truth, um, pulling that out of the Akashic records for you. And then you have more choice because there's a quote by one of my teachers and I love it. It says, um, it's not the truth that sets you free. It's knowing the truth that sets you free. Yeah. And how that, true. That's like the biggest bulk of my work is, is bringing people to truth so that they have more choice. So then they can be clear, confident, you know, all those things that, that, mm. that help not only in business, but in life. So Kasha, I would love to sort of talk a little bit more about the Akashic records because this is a very new term for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most people would be asking, what is that process like? So when you have someone come to see you, for example, and say, you know, I seem to be stuck at the same problem over and over again, year after year, and I've gone through NLP, I've gone through therapy, I've gone through coaching and nothing seems to give, what would sort of be the first thing that you do and how do you use the Akashic Records method into the healing? So it works very much if you've ever had a reading done, whether it's a tarot reading or any type of an intuitive reading. Um, the Akashic Records is basically a vibrational archive of the soul. It's been known about for millennia, as, you know, as long as people have been aware of themselves. I'm actually doing a lot of research into like the science behind it. And it's mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned in all kinds of um, texts all around the world. So it's not confined to any one faith or religion. Um, some Ooh. people call it the morphogenic field. Abraham Hicks calls it the vortex. And there's ways that you can access it. The, the particular teacher that I study with, Linda Howe, has a, a pathway prayer that you, um, you speak it. And the vibration of speaking that prayer um, opens it up. And then I'm able to get the energy out of or sit in the energy of that and get the information that I ask for. Um, from my understanding, anyone can do this, but not everybody, I guess, either wants to or, or is able to. Um, from what I've been told is, you know, you, you have, so you have beings in the Akashic Records who work with me and my own dedication, like my own stubbornness ten, and tenacity has allowed me to be really good at this because I want the truth for people. Like I, mm. I will not settle for anything less than that. And so, um, that and my practice and other intuitive um, modalities, basically I've just sharpened this gift. Like if, if you wanted to do this, you could totally study this and, and practice it and you would do, be able to do this work too. I feel like this work found me. Um, and so uh, when I first discovered the Akashic Records, I wasn't even going to use it with clients. I was going to use it for myself to heal my own crap. And then one day in a session, so I work right now one-on-one -on -one with clients, I was guided to open up a client's record. And so basically the first thing I do is ask permission. And then I say the pathway prayer and then, you know, I sit in that energy. Um, what it feels like for me is, is being, it, it, if you can imagine what it would feel like to stand under a waterfall with mm -hmm. the, the water like beating on your head, that's the energy I feel. It's just like, it's this cascade of, whatever it is, energy of, of whatever caliber and feeling, seeing, um, some words and I just speak and mm. the, the, it's, it's real time. The sessions I do are hundred percent real time. So I don't just take your information, go do a reading and then email the, the results. Um, I do the reading with you right there. So you can ask questions. We can do the healing right there and, um, you shift right, right there. And you walk away with a whole bunch of guidance and stuff. Right. And with this sort of work, do you find that, you know, because, because for example, there could be sort of pros and cons for this sort of work where there, I, I know a lot of people that would go to healers and things like that. And then they fully rely on them to make mm. every decision under the moon for them, which takes away their power of yeah. intuition and their own instinct to guide their path. Um, yeah. How do you manage to make sure that not only are you you know, you can get a sort of download of guidance and you share that with them, but you're also empowering them that they have this power as well, that they have this intuition that they can tap into that allows them to, to know what's right or wrong for their life. That's a great question. 
Um, the biggest thing we do with my clients in the Akashic Records is figure out where they're stuck and then get those blocks healed. Because when, when you can remove the crap that's like the, the onion skins that are blocking you from, from knowing this stuff for yourself, your intuition gets louder, your heart whispers get stronger, you can hear better for yourself. And that's my number one goal. I do not want to be anyone's go-to person. Um, like definitely, I think it's great to, to check in maybe, you know, in the beginning, once you're, when you're trying to clear out a lot of shit, shit, yes. <laughs> I forgot that I can swear. Yes, you can. <laughs> when you're trying to clear out, a, especially if it's like a big old story, um, we work monthly for, for about 11 weeks together. But then after that, you don't need it as often because you're able to hear your own answers more clearly. Another thing that, that happens in this session is you get to meet your business guides. And, and we are given the exact technique, the exact energy that you need to tap into so that you can work with your guides without me having to intercede or intervene for you mm. or read for you. So one of my biggest goals with my clients is to empower them to be able to do this work for themselves. Mm. Um, anybody can do this for themselves. Like, honestly, if you read the book, if you take the class, you will be able to do this. It might take you longer. And I think that's why we have coaches and healers and doctors and stuff, because if you want to expedite the process and, and you want help, especially I tend to work with people who are towards the end of their healing journey. Like they've done the DIY, they're done. They just don't give a shit what the lesson is anymore. They just like, they just want to like finish healing and get closure. That's when the door is open the widest. That's when I can take you and yank you over to the other side where mm. you're like, okay, I can breathe. I know who I am. It's kind of scary because this is like, I don't feel the pain anymore. So now let's figure out okay, what does that look like? What does it feel like to be you and integrate all that and then like go forth and do your thing? Yeah, I think it's so important to allow that power to come back to the individual because the whole point of them being lost is believing that they don't have the power, right? right. To control their reality. And, and whether or not you believe in guides or God or whatever it is, at the end of the day, even the guides and God is you, right? It's, it comes right. from within you. And so you could say these are the different parts. I mean, I like to sort of sometimes use that analogy. It's like, well, yeah, I have like a, a, a sort of council member, you know, a, a, a council members in my team of Lydia, where I can tap into different versions of me to give me the guidance because ultimately underneath all the shit and underneath all the fear and conditionings and identity crisis that I've ever experienced, I do truly know what I want, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's about removing, as you said, that shit on the shit pile, right? On the first layer so that you could be intuitive and actually use yourself as, as sort of a guide, you know, to, to have a GPS of, of where your heart wants to go next in your life. Um, so I, I want I want to sort of uh, before we sort of end the, the interview, I would love to talk a little bit more about relationship to our emotions because a lot of us get very trapped in how mm -hmm. we feel to dictate what we think we can have, right? So if we're depressed and we are feeling not worthy, we think that that's sort of where we're going to end up, and that this if this feeling is so real, it must be real, right? So um, what do you think are the most common misconceptions people have about their emotions, especially when going through change and transition? Mm -hmm. And how do we bypass these sort of sticky parts of that trigger to move forward? That's a great question. And that's one of the, the pillars of the work that I do is helping people change their relationship to their emotions. You know, we all love feeling happy um, because it feels good. Not everybody loves to feel all the crappy emotions, like the negative emotions. I feel like negative emotions have such a bad reputation it and does. it's only because they're so misunderstood and we don't know how to deal with them. Like most of us were never taught how to deal with our negative emotions. Um, negative emotions have such an important purpose. Let's say you're a little kid and something happens that freaks you out and you don't know how to deal with that emotion in the moment. Your unconscious mind or subconscious mind, its number one job is to keep you safe. And so it takes that emotion and it stuffs it down in your body until you have the tools to cope with it or release it. Most of us never get those tools. And that's why the trauma sticks. Um, so when a negative emotion comes up, it's not to piss you off. It's not to, you know, most of them come up because we're emotionally triggered. Like whether someone cuts you off on the freeway or, you know, you see a guy who looks like a guy who hurt you in the past and you go into that state of fear, um, 
it's coming up because now you are safe to feel it and you could take the opportunity to release it. So the other job of the unconscious mind to keep you safe is to help you get rid of this shit. Because we know that if we keep emotions stuck in our body, they're going to make us sick. Like this is, this isn't even woo woo anymore. This is just science at this point. Um, so when an emotion comes up like that, it's your body and your mind trying to give you a road sign to deal with that emotion and process it. Now, how does that, how do you do that? And that's sort of part of, you know, the, the teaching work that I do to empower my clients is teach them exactly how to process emotions in the moment that they happen. Because if you try to resist that emotion and run away from it, that's fine. It'll just get stuffed back down. But guess what? Like tomorrow it'll happen again. And then if you bottleneck it and you stuff it down too often, pretty soon, tiny little triggers are going to make you like blow up like a can of soda, right? It's, it's yeah. we've all had that happen. It happens yeah. to me. <laughs> so how do you deal with your negative emotion? The biggest one, or, or so there's four steps that I teach. The first one is whatever it is that you're feeling, call it by the name that makes sense to you. So you have to put your own label on it. Like, let's say I'm feeling anger, but anger doesn't quite cut it. It's like mind numbing rage or something. I would call it truthfully what it is. Like whatever it is that you're feeling, call it out by name. The second step is your mind is going to start narrating to you what's happening. It's going to bring up all the other past times that you've felt this. And remember that guy and remember what... It, it's got this like story going on. Don't listen to it. Focus in on the actual physical sensation of that emotion in your body because that's where your unconscious mind put it in the first place. So this takes a little bit of practice. You're going to have that voice. Acknowledge it and like, you know, it'll be there. Focus in on where in your physical body you feel that sensation. Um, you could start practicing with, with positive emotions like when you feel joy or happiness notice where you feel that and get to know how your body responds um, step three is remember that you're safe in this moment that this this emotion is coming up you're absolutely safe to feel it and if it if you have it inside you to even get to a place of gratitude for your body and your mind having kept you safe all this time um, to to you know get you to, to that you coped all this time in your life and now you have this opportunity to release it. Can you find gratitude inside yourself, not only for this emotion, but also for like this being that you are this amazing mechanism for processing emotions and then ask that negative emotion, what does it need? Mm. And it'll be either love acceptance or acknowledgement. Usually it's one of those three. Sometimes I've had other things, but Literally, like, ask yourself. So zero in on it in your body and ask it, what do you need? And listen for the first answer that pops in your mind. And then imagine yourself giving that to this emotion, giving that to yourself. So, of course, this is all happening in your head. Um, you know, you're imagining this in your mind's eye. You could say it out loud if you're in a private place and there's no one around. Um, so that's step number three. And then the last step I call sewing up the spirit. What happens often is when we're very emotional, our spirit leaves our body. This isn't like a, an out of body thing, but our, our energy just gets so scrambled that a big chunk of it just like comes up and out. You can call that energy back and ground it in your whole body. So, so there's different ways you can do this. Um, the way I like to do it is I imagine all the different energy uh, pieces that I have, like my body, mind, soul, spirit, like pieces of fabric, and I'm putting a quilt square together. So just stacking them nicely and then asking, you know, your angels, guides, or whoever to like sew them together using light. My daughter likes to, and I love how she came up with this. She imagines her body like a, like a jug and her energy being poured back in like water. So then right. you, whatever so visual funny. that works for you whatever visual and and that really grounds you back together and and then the emotion's gone and you might need to do this often like mm -hmm. i guarantee you will need to do this often but the more you do it the less the things will trigger you yeah and i think it's just even the simple step of acknowledging the fear and having a conversation with it it allows yeah. it to sort of be collaborative with you versus this enemy that can't stop yapping in your ear you, you know because yeah. 
I mean, you would say that to another human in your life, if they're being negative and critical, you would go, why are you saying that? Like, what do you need? You know? Right. And so it's sort of the same thing with the emotion. It's like, well, if you ignore it and you just go, don't come back and, and, and see me. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll always be there with you. So it's about learning to play nice with it and learning to communicate with it to right. actually, there's a lot of clues in fears, isn't it? It's, it doesn't yes. necessarily yes. mean you're not supposed to do the thing you, you're, you want to do. You're afraid, but afraid just means there's a missing gap of information. There's a That's missing right. gap of skills or support or whatever it is that you need to, uh, to feel courageous enough to go to that next door. Uh, so I, I love that, that process that, that you've mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, if people are at this point interested in learning those four steps and doing that as a practice and learning more about how to heal um, the emotions that keep them trapped uh, on a physical level and also on a spiritual level, do you have any tools on your website and where can people find your work as well as any sort of support resources to help them on this journey? Absolutely. My website, um, kasharashville.com, uh, if you go kasharashville.com forward slash start here, I have all the resources that I've created. Um, my, all my free resources are on that page. So you can go in there and, and grab as many as you feel called to. And one of the ones, um, it, it's a four, I believe it's four or five days of emails where I teach this process that I just described, Great. but in more detail, um, because, you know, we only have a short time. So yeah. that's, that's on there. Go grab it and, and use it. Right. Thank you so very much, Kasha. You gave us a great two-part video. One was all about sort of being a mom, being an entrepreneur, dealing with depression, which I think postpartum is something people don't talk about very often, especially entrepreneurs are like, they just have that to do and we're not going to talk about this. Uh, right. So I'm really glad you talked about it, being vulnerable about it and transparent about this. Uh, absolutely appreciate that. Uh, mm -hmm. And also talking to us a lot about the emotional release that we need uh, to live the courageous life that, that we want. And thank you so much for the free resources. Uh, we'll be sure to share all the links for Kasha uh, in the in, if you're watching this on the video blog, we'll have all the links, active links ready for you. You can get uh, all these free resources to get you started. Uh, and if uh, you need to contact Kasha, she'll be available, I'm sure. Uh, she loves this work. She's passionate about it. She knows what it feels like to be you. Uh, and I wanted to thank you for taking the time to share your story, uh, share your pain, uh, and also how that transformed your work and how you live uh, your unconventional life today as well. Thank you so much. It's been such an honor. I really loved it. Thank Thanks, you. Kasha. Hey, thank you so very much for watching Screw the Cubicle TV and don't forget to subscribe below to get all the latest cubicle crashing content on how to quit your 9 to 5 and create a life and business on your own terms.